There's something that is built into American culture and American society. It is actually, you could say, it's, it's a part of our identity, and that is independence. We want to do things our way, and we often want to do it on our own. You know, all a teacher has to do is mention we're going to have a group project and everyone goes, no, and the complaining starts and people are like, oh, because they don't want to work with someone else. I don't want to work in a group. I want to do it on my own. I want to do it my way. I don't want to have to depend on anyone. I don't want to have anyone else uh, not pulling their weight or not doing their part and, 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 uh, or thinking I'm dumb and I can't do it good enough or what. We don't like group projects. Kids complain, people, well, anyone who's in school, even adults, when I was in seminary and college, people still complained about group projects. But it's funny because here in America, we celebrate independence. In fact, we literally ce celebrate independence every 4th of July. You know, when we declared our independence and revolted against the authorities that were above us. But we also in America celebrate not needing other people. Being able to do things on our own, being self-sufficient. We proudly assert sentiments and statements like, I am a self-made man. I did this all by myself, on my own. And if I think about the word dependence, it almost comes, it's almost a bad word, right? I mean, it, dependence, we only think of dependence as a good thing when we get to mark off dependence on our taxes returns. But we don't think of a dependence, being dependent upon others, as a good thing. In fact, we think of it as a weakness. But dependence and interdependence is a biblical Christian concept. And we will see this today as we continue to talk about Christian community or life together. The Apostle Paul uses the illustration of the human body to describe the church, the people of God, the body of Christ, and to teach us about our interdependence upon one another. You see, as Christians, we belong to the body of Christ. We belong to the church, the body of Christ. And being a part of the body of Christ, we are inseparable, inseparably connected both to Jesus and to each other. Now, this is true of the church worldwide and from all times. But this is also specifically true of our local church, of our local expression of the church. We are a body. But what does that mean? And how does that affect my life? We will answer these questions as we look at five descriptions of the body of Christ. The first thing is the body of Christ is a unique body. Beginning in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that, be that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul starts by telling us here that we have one body, or we are one body, and he's referring here to the body of Christ, or the church. So there is one church made up of all the believers in the world from every race and from all times. And we are all connected as one. So that means there are not many bodies or many churches, a bunch of churches, but one. Now, that may strike us as odd because we know that here we have a church and over there's a church and over there's a church and over there's a church. And you know what? We are one. We are connected. But we have local churches that, which I mentioned a minute ago, are an expression of the body as a whole. And so here we are, but we are the body of Christ. We are one. And he goes on and he says there is one spirit. And there he's talking about the Holy Spirit who indwells all believers and unites us together and to Christ. He says there is one hope. 
And when he's there, he's talking about that all believers are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and are forgiven and reconciled to God. You see, as sinners, we were cut off from God, separated from Him, and Jesus died on the cross so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but will have everlasting life. That is our hope. We who have believed in Jesus are reconciled to God and ultimately have eternal life. And that is our hope, the only hope. And every believer has that same hope. He continues and says, There is one Lord. And there he is talking about Jesus, the Son of God, who became a man, who died on the cross, who rose again, and has been exalted to the highest place, and therefore we call him Lord. He is our Master. He is our Lord. There is one Lord, one head of the body. In fact, I'm going to turn back and look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And he says, and he put all things, God put all things under his, Jesus' feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. You see, God gave Jesus as head over the church. He made Jesus as Lord, as master, as head of the church. And there is one and only one Lord. There is only one head of the church. But that also means that we are connected to Jesus and we are dependent upon Jesus. I mean, think for a minute of the illustration of the body. A head, or excuse me, a body disconnected from its head is dead. That was a poem. <laughs> a body disconnected from head has no life. And so we, as the church, as the body of Christ, are connected to Jesus and we gain our life and everything through Jesus. And it is through Jesus that we are filled with godly character and made holy. We must be connected to Jesus. We are connected to Jesus as the body of Christ. Paul continues on. He says, there is one faith. And this refers to our set of beliefs, the things we believe about Jesus and about salvation and about how we come to faith in Christ and are reconciled to God. We have one faith. There is only one way to be saved. There is only one way to be reconciled to the Father, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. There is one faith. And then he says there is one baptism. And this baptism is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might say, wait a minute, but we do water baptism as, all, as well. And we say, yes, we do. And water baptism is a symbol of what happens to us when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. But this says there is one baptism, and it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When the, bapti when the Holy Spirit baptizes us, he brings us into the body, unites us with Christ and with the rest of the body. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. So no matter what your background is, whether, whether you were a Jew or whether you were a non-Jew, a Gentile, or whether you were a slave or free, so no matter if you were poor or rich, if you, it doesn't matter who you, where you came from, what your race is, all believers in Jesus Christ have been united together by the one spirit. And he continues in that verse, And all were made to drink of one spirit. So there is one Holy Spirit who joins us all together as one body. And then he concludes his list by saying there is one God and Father. There is one and only one God. And he is sovereign over all people and over all things. And all believers are rightly related to the one true God because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But only believers, only those who are in the body of Christ, are reconciled to God, are rightly related to God. Only those who believe in Jesus. You know, I'm telling you, this is something special. You see, as a believer in Jesus, as being part of the body of Christ, we are reconciled to God. We are made right with our Creator. We are connected to Jesus Christ and connected to each other. This is something special. This is something unique. We belong to a, we are a unique body. 
But not only is this body of Christ unique, it is a healthy body. Look at, stay in in Ephesians, but back in chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. He says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. This verse here is saying that Jesus made peace. Now, the context here, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews, and how they were at odds with each other. They were separated by the law because the Jews had been given the law and the Gentiles had not received the law. And so the Jews, they had the law and they knew this is how I should live. This is how I rightly relate to God. And the Gentiles, they didn't have that law. But the Jews, somewhere along the line, became a little arrogant about that and said, well, look, we know God and you don't. We have the law and you don't. And it caused problems between the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, the Jews were supposed to follow the law and live by the law and, and, and therefore uh, cause people to be interested in God and want to come to know God. But they somehow became a little self-righteous. And they thought we were better than the others because God gave us his law. And there became hostility between Jews and Gentiles. But we're told here that Jesus came and he removed that hostility. When Jesus went to the cross, he fulfilled the law and it says that he abolished the law, meaning that he made a, 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 a way for people to be saved apart from the law. And everyone who comes to Jesus is is reconciled to God through Jesus. There is one way, as we had just talked about. And so now Jesus made peace. He removed the thing that brought on the hostility, and he brought all believers together. In fact, in verse 15, the end of verse 15, he says uh, that he might create for himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So he brought people together. And gave them peace because they are now all rightly related to God through Jesus Christ. I want you to think for a minute. Have you ever been sick? Like sick to your stomach? And, you know, your stomach hurts and you start tossing and turning. And eventually you're just writhing in pain. And you're like, every move you make, you're like, oh, I can't get away from the pain. And it's like you're trying to run away from it. You roll over here and there and just, oh, it just hurts. And it feels like there's a battle going on within you because you're sick. And when it finally subsides, you feel like, ah, peace. You see, you have peace. And see, Jesus came to bring peace to the body, peace to people, to believers. And really the only way the church could be healthy is by Jesus bringing peace. Because if you had this group and this group who were constantly fighting, there would not be peace. But Jesus brought peace. He destroyed the hostility. And so all people who are are saved the same way and are unified through Jesus Christ. Verse 19 says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, now we are one. Jesus made us a new community, not separated by racial distinctions or anything else, but brought together as one, as a new community. All believers connected to each other and to God, unified by Jesus Christ. Now here's the thing, and maybe you've seen this or experienced, the the church, the body of Christ doesn't always look like that. We don't always look like we're at peace with one another. In fact, sometimes there are fights within churches. There are people who are, I mean, we are divided. We will disagree and we will stand up and we will argue. We will backbite, we will gossip. You know what all that is? Sin. 
If we are divided, it's because we are failing to express our unity that we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus made peace so we can be one. And if we are not living that way, it's because we are sinning and failing to express who we are in Jesus Christ. Who we are as a body. Every once in a while when I sleep, my arms will fall asleep. Or I'll sleep on an arm. And, I'll, and sometimes when I try and go to sleep, I'm like, I can't get comfortable. And I've joked before about, it'd be nice if I could just take this arm off. And just set it on the nightstand, pick it up in the morning, put it back on. And then it would be a whole lot easier for me to sleep. But you know what? I can't. You know why? It's part of my body. And it doesn't have latches. You know, it's connected to me. And the same is true with the church. We can't say, you know what, I have trouble getting along with this person, so I'm just going to, let's just move them out. Let's just take them off and send them away. Let me just avoid this person and have nothing to do with them. Jesus brought us together to be one. Not to bicker and to say, you know what, I just would like to take this arm off for a little bit so I can have some peace. Wait a minute. We have peace. And if we're having problems with that, then the problem is here. And we need to figure that out. We can't remove people from the body. We must pursue unity. We must pursue closeness. We must pursue peace and live as a body. The next characteristic is the body of Christ is a strong body. Ephesians, back in chapter 4, but starting in verse 11. Paul writes, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's pretty high measure. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. This, these verses start out by telling us that God gave people with spiritual gifts to do a work in the church. But he said that he gave these people, God gave these people in order to equip the people of the church, the body of for the work of ministry. In other words, for the building up of the body. You know, he didn't say he gave these people to do all the work of the church. He didn't say, I gave a few people to do all of the ministry. I gave a few people who are supposed to do everything and everyone else just sits and is fed by them. That is not what he said. He said he gave these leaders to come with these certain gifts to help everyone be a part of the ministry so that everyone in the church, everyone in the body is equipped to do the work of ministry. You know what that means? That means it's every one of our responsibility to do the work of ministry. God never said one person or two people or 20% of the people in the church should do all the work. He says everyone in the body is to do the work of ministry. Everyone in the body is to be built up and equipped so then they can go and build up each other and work helping each other to grow and to become mature. And if you notice that what he said, he said all these things, he says are, that, that we want to be mature and, and, and godly and like Jesus. You know what that means? That means as, as, as believers, as Christians, we are all bodybuilders. And I'm talking about the church here. But the illustration fits. We are bodybuilders. Our responsibility is to build up the body. We all do the work of the ministry. We all fulfill the Great Commission. Our goal as believers is for all believers, for the entire body to become united, to have a complete knowledge of Jesus and of the truth of God, to become fully mature, to be godly, to be like Jesus, so no one can easily be misled. So no one can be easily misled. So that everyone in the body 
is mature. So that everyone in the body is growing and becoming more and more like Jesus. And we do this growing together. Look at verse 15. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So we grow up into Jesus, to being like Jesus, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So when we are each doing our part, doing the thing, acting and working in the place we've been put, the body grows. When we all serve together, the body grows. It's a natural thing that happens, that God makes to happen. So he's put this body together, we all work together, and the body grows. But this also means that we can grow or we can function correctly as a body only when we are relating properly to Jesus, who is the head. And only when we are relating properly to each other, because we are all connected. God has joined us together to work together, to become like Jesus together. Now, you may not even notice this anymore, but when you open your bulletin on Sunday morning, the very first thing that's on there, on the top left, it says, following Jesus, how? Together. This is why that statement is on our bulletin, because we work together together. We live together. We serve together. We follow Jesus together because we are connected. Julie and I had a friend in Texas who was a bodybuilder. And the things he put his body through was ridiculous. I mean, he decided he wanted to do this and he, I would say he abused his body in order to make it big. And he actually would go and compete in bodybuilding builder contests. But I was amazed at what he would do, what he put his body through. I mean, he would eat pounds, I mean literally pounds and pounds of meat every day. And he would go and he would lift and lift and lift to exhaustion and work out stuff. He was constantly carrying around a protein shake because he had to. He put his body through so much he had to replenish it. I would hate to see their grocery bill. I, I mean, when I'm talking, he pulled out this one day this, this, this slab of hamburger that was probably four or five pounds and, oh, that's my lunch kind of thing. You know, it's like, and, and then he has snacks and then he has dinner. And I was like, I could not believe it. But you know what? That's what he chose to do. And he committed to it and said, I'm going to do this. And you know what? He saw results. He got huge. Now, this friend happened to be a Marine. <laughs> and when I saw pictures of him when he first went into boot camp, and I was surprised because he was a scrawny little guy. But now when I knew him, he was huge. But the thing is, is when he did this, he chose to do it, he committed to it, he saw results, but this was a pretty all-consuming thing in his life. This is what he did. I mean, he worked, and he had a family, but they had to fit into his bodybuilding regimen. It became all-consuming. But you know what that tells us? Building a body doesn't just happen. You can't just sit on the couch or watch TV and expect your body to balloon, well, it'll balloon up a different way. It doesn't just happen. You have to choose. You have to commit. You have to work at it in order to see results. And this is also true of building up the body of Christ. You have to choose that you are going to do it, that you are going to be a part of the body, that you are going to act as a part of the body and live out your responsibility, that you are going to commit to it. So will you? Will you commit to live in authentic community, to truly know each other and to live life together? Will you 
invest your lives in the lives of other believers. Because if the body is to grow, if we are to build up the body, it only happens when we choose and commit to do it. And we are working together as a body and living life together. When we come to the next description, the body of Christ is a perfectly designed body. For this one, we're going to have to turn back into 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. Now, let me start by just reading the beginning of chapter 12, verse 12. He says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. I'm going to stop there. At this point, he's talking about the body. So the body is one. It has many, many members. He's talking about our physical body. Because he's starting the illustration here. He's going to use this as an illustration for the church. But he's talking about our physical body. He says, just like our body has many parts, but it's one body. We have arms, we have legs, we have eyes and ears, but it's all one body. They're not separate. My, my leg, if it was over there, wouldn't it be just a body of its own? It would be my leg. It would be detached, but it would be over there. But it would be my leg. But he says, we have many parts, but we are one body. But let's stop and think for a minute about the human body. Do you know the adult body is made up of 206 bones, 640 muscles. And then you have the ligaments that attach it and hold it all together. You have all our internal organs. You have the heart, the brain, the nervous system, the nerves that tell us when we have pain or, or pleasure and those kinds of things. Um, think about the body. It is an amazing thing. And there are many parts to the body, and it all works together and functions as a single body. You know, God did an amazing thing when he created our human bodies. Even non-believers, people who don't believe in God, believe the body is an amazing thing. This is the picture that Paul uses of the church. He says, it's an amazing thing. Look how God put the human body together. He did the same thing with the church. He put the body of Christ together. He put the right parts together and, and knit them together the right way so that they function together and work together and everything comes out right. God perfectly designed our human bodies. He perfectly designed the church, the body of Christ. And this is what he compared, how he compares the church. Look at verse 12. The end of verse 12, he says, So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. That's obvious. There are many of us, but we make up one body. Verse 15, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. So if the foot says, you know what, I'm not a hand, I'm not important, I'm not really part of this body. If my foot could talk and said that, it would be lying. <laughs> it would be deluded because it's connected to me. It's part of my body. And this is the point he's making. He's saying, don't be ludicrous. Just because you think you're not something different or a different part of the body, that doesn't make you any less part of the body. Verse 16 says, if, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Same, same point. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? And he's making a very clear point here. He's saying, this crazy to think that a body could be made up of just an eye. If you were just an eye, there would be a whole lot missing from your body. There would be a whole lot you could not do. If you were just an ear walking around, well, you couldn't be just an ear walking around because ears don't have feet. But that's the point. You aren't, you're missing things. We are, every single part of the body is necessary, is needed. And he says in the same way, the body of Christ, every part is important. Every part is necessary. Verse 18, but as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. And that is a 
cool thing to think about. You know, God arranges the body as he chooses. That means he put it together right, and God doesn't make mistakes. He put us in this body together on purpose. Specifically, he had a purpose for it. But he arranges it as he chose. Verse 19, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Here we have the opposite idea. Earlier he said the foot saying, well, I'm not that, so I'm not important. Here he's saying that the one part can't say to another part, you're not important. Every part is important. Verse 22, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now think about this for a minute. Our body, the parts of our body, our human body that seem to be weaker, like say our internal organs, they're weaker in a sense, right? Because you can't take them outside. They have to be inside. They be, they're protected by bone and by, by skin and, and muscle. If you were to take your heart out and lay it on the table, it wouldn't last very long. He says, they are indispensable. In a way, they're weaker or seem weaker, but they're indispensable. How long can you live without a heart? You can't. He says, just like that, everyone in the body is important. Everyone is indispensable. He says, and on the parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and we are, uh, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty with which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. He's saying now there's some parts that, you know, we cover think about our body, there are parts that we cover in modesty. He said, but they're still important. He said, it doesn't matter what happens in the church or, who, or, or who's in the church. They're all important. Don't push it too far and try to say, well, that person's the part that we cover. <laughs> That's not what he's getting at. <laughs> he's saying we're all important. Verse 26 is as if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We're a body. We're connected. We rejoice together. We suffer together. We mourn together. We are many individuals. We are different. We are not all the same. We have different roles to play even within the church. But we are all one body, perfectly designed by God. And we, as the body of Christ, are interdependent. We all need each other, every one of us. No one is expendable. No one is unnecessary. No one is unimportant. Well, the last characteristic I want to talk about is that the body of Christ is a well-adjusted body. You know, every once in a while, a, a healthy body and a perfectly designed body gets a little out of whack, and it has to be adjusted. I'm going to tell you a little story about when uh, one time when, uh, when Michael was a baby, so it was a while ago. I was, I was a youth pastor at the time, and uh, I had a pair of shoes that were Nike Airs, and the air chamber on one of them had popped and flattened out, and so I was walking around kind of uneven for a while, and I didn't know it. Well, I was out playing basketball with some high school kids one day, and I went up and I took a shot, and when I came down, I went, ow! I got this little stinger in my neck, and I was like, that didn't feel good. And, but, you know, being who I am, I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> And I keep trying, and I can't. It just hurts so bad. So I'm like, i got to sit down, guys. And so I sit down on this picnic table, and then I kind of lay back. And then I'm like, nothing is working. i got to go home. And so I get in the car. And by the time I got home, that was only about a you know, two- to five-minute drive. By the time I got home, my head was stuck like this. 
The muscles in my back and my neck had spasmed and pulled my neck over. Well, long story short, the muscles had to relax. I, had, I went in to see a chiropractor for the first time in my life, and he told me my whole entire body was like, was shifted out of whack. And he adjusted me. He straightened me out. And I use that illustration to say this. You know, within the church body, sometimes things get a little out of whack. Sometimes things need to be adjusted. Sometimes we need to have things fixed. Look at the book of Romans. It's to the left of Corinthians, one, uh, one book. The book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. Paul writes, for the grace given to me, excuse me, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. He's saying, hey, we all belong to each other. We are all connected. He says, you need to make sure that you're not thinking wrong. You need to make sure you don't have a wrong attitude. And specifically what he's talking about is thinking too highly of yourself. You see, if I think too highly of myself, I'm going to start thinking lowly of other people. I, I, he's saying, you be careful. You don't go around thinking, you know, well, I'm more important. But he says, think correctly. Think soberly. He said, don't go around thinking that other people are less important than you. We are all part of the body. There is no one who is more important. Don't start belittling others or thinking too little of others. Because when we start thinking too much of ourselves and too, too little of other people, the community suffers. The thing is, is it comes natural to us to think about ourselves first. But if we are going to be Christ-like, if we are going to be like Jesus, then we will think of others first. So we need to seek what is best for the body. And if we are out of whack in this way, we need to have an adjustment. Matthew chapter 5, the very first book of the New Testament, Jesus is talking and in Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 23 and 24, Jesus says this, So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, this is a very interesting statement by Jesus, and it's a very strong statement by Jesus. He's saying, if you come and you're about to worship and you realize there's a problem over here, he says, you go take care of the problem first and then come back and worship. You see, if our relationship with fellow Christians are not right, then our relationship with Jesus Christ is not right. Our relationship with God is not right because we are connected to each other. Think about this. Have you ever stubbed your toe? You kick the wall and they're like, oh, and you may hop around. You, may, uh, uh, you have to sit down, whatever it is, and you feel like, oh, your whole entire body feels the pain of that little toe. Isn't it amazing how that little toe can cause devastating pain throughout your entire body? And if your toe's not right, your body is not right. And this is the idea. If there's something that's not right, you've got to get it right. If you hurt your toe, you're going to sit down and you're going to rub that toe or you're going to put ice on it. Or you're going to do whatever you have to do to get it work. You know, sometimes you try to walk after you're your toe and it's like, ah, you can't even walk. Well, if part of our body is suffering and we're ignoring it, then things aren't right. If part of our Christian body, our church, the body of Christ is suffering and we're ignoring it, then something's not right. And we need to get it right. One part of the body affects the whole body. But that means that we can't truly worship God when you have bitterness in your heart against another fellow Christian.
Let me take it a step further, because this is actually what Jesus says. He says, if you come to the altar and you realize someone has something against you, so if you know that someone else has a problem with you, or you have done something to offend or hurt someone else, he says, you leave your gift and you go get it right and then come back to offer your offerings to worship. You see, I think we, we think of it the exact opposite sometimes because we think, well, you know, I'm struggling with so-and-so and, -so, and uh, you know, I just need to go, go worship because if I go worship, then my mind will get right. And so, in a way, that's true, but you know what? That's not what Jesus says because you're not, your mind and your heart is not right to worship if you have division in the body. So he says, if someone has something against you, if you know someone is upset with something you did or someone, maybe it's not something you did. You just know that they have bad feelings to you. You go and do as much as you can to work that out and make it right and then come back and worship. And then you can come back and worship together as a body, as one, united. And you can offer your praise to God from a pure heart. Work it out. And worship together. And let me just add this one little last thing. Everybody needs a healthy diet and exercise. We know that. Your physical body needs it. And spiritually speaking, the church, as a church, we need to be fed. As Christians, we need to be spiritually fed and challenged. And we do that when we come together. And when we live together. We feed, we, we come to church and we are taught the word of God. We, we get together with other believers and we study together. We encourage each other. We correct each other. We work together. Everyone needs to be fed and challenged. And as the body of Christ, we are called to do it together. And next week, I'm going to talk about some specifics of how we can do that. But today, we are a body. We need each other. We cannot become like Jesus in isolation. We have all, each one of us, been given the responsibility to care for and build up the body of Christ. So I close with these three questions of challenge. The first one, are you willing to step out of your comfort zone in order to open up your life and share life with others. Number two, are you willing to step up to the challenge to lead a life group? To build up the body. Number three, are you willing to invest yourselves in the lives of others in this body? This is what we have been called to as the body of Christ.